tales for dark nights. Jeremiah Huffman. Narration, production, and sound design by Jesse Cornett. Original score by Brandon Boone. Gormley ran a stubby finger across his lips. They were leathery and cracked. He'd had nothing to eat the previous day but coffee and sweets, and he'd been up all night riding. His tongue felt furry in his mouth, like the tail of some anxious little animal hiding in the dark hollow of a rotting stump. He was staring out the single window of the kitchenette at the back of his trailer, eyes fixed upon the mailbox which seemed miles away, standing alone in the early morning fog. Soon the postman would show up and once again unwittingly play Gormley's harbinger of doom. The thought made the fat little man smile and his lower lip split down the center. A small bead of red bubbled from the slit and Gormley raked it into his mouth with square yellow dingers. He took another swig of his coffee and got up to pace the floor. The postman was a bit late. Perhaps it was the fog. Gormley himself couldn't recognize much outside his window. The blacktop road that led back to town appeared to have drowned in the murk. The dry brambles of the thicket occasionally revealed their twisting, jagged tips as the fog slithered through the spaces between the branches. The gloom emanated from the woods outside as if exhaled by the ancient, wicked lungs of some unseen demon. Gormley wanted to step out and look toward town to see if he could see any approaching fog lights, but he knew he'd be wasting his time. He sat back down at his shabby little table and unwrapped his last peppermint candy. He looked at the disorganized stacks of paper in front of him, printed photos of children, photos from yearbooks, sports teams, vacations, all of them emblazoned with the same word in thick, bold lettering, the word missing. Gormley perused the photos as if he were picking out a steak at a butcher shop. He would pick up each photo and study it. He'd read the accompanied information and he would deliberate. His criteria weren't strict. Mostly, he based his decision on how happy the child looked in the picture. Gormley hated their smiles. If the child repulsed him enough, he would place the photo to the side in a special pile. Once he'd whittled his list down to one, he'd read up on the case. When and where the child disappeared what they were wearing that day, where they'd been spotted since. If they'd been spotted since. He'd research all he could about the child's parents, siblings, if he or she had any pets or participated in any extracurricular activities. He'd even try to learn what the child's favorite color was, if he could. Information like this was valuable to his work and the internet made things so much easier. It hadn't always been so easy. and used to take him up to a year to get the information he needed to produce one letter. Gormley felt pride in the fact that this year alone, his first year of retirement, 
He'd been able to produce a very convincing letter every couple of weeks. Thank the good Lord for technology. He singled out a photo, the subject of his latest work, and he regarded it with an obnoxious sneer. The little boy in the picture was nauseatingly happy. He was wearing a cap with an emblem of a cartoon tiger hitting a baseball and a t-shirt in matching blue and orange. The boy held a small trophy in his hands and he looked so damned proud of himself. Gormley reclined in his chair and thought of the letter sitting in the mouth of his lonely mailbox. Dear Mrs. Ableton, your worries are at an end. I'm the man who, who four years and seven months ago took your boy Trevor from your car while she shopped. We sat and watched you return with your gallon of milk before we drove away. You may consider yourself lucky. He did not suffer long, and he remained a virgin. I hope that you have since learned to lock your doors, for men like me are everywhere. And went on for four full pages depicting the most believable abduction torture and murder scenario that Gormley could envision, custom detailed for little Trevor Ableton. Gormley was especially proud of the bit about the jar of spiders. He'd learned about the boy's arachnophobia, and such a particularity was too exquisite to omit. In his eyes, Gormley was helping these families get over it all move on with their lives. He put a stop to their uncertainty. Most of all, he gave them something to hate. And what a great motivator that was. Hate was what got him up and cracking before the sun could show itself. Hate was what had fueled him all of his life. Hatred was what made him exceptional. Other children had been spoiled. They lived under the illusion that somebody cared about them. And if somebody didn't, then at least that somebody should care. Gormley's expression curdled at the very idea. He could almost taste those thoughts of false love and feigned affection gurgling up the back of his throat like bile. And he fought them back by lapping at the dissolving peppermint in his mouth. The whole love thing was a joke. Parents really cared for children as children cared for their toys, as objects of dreams and fantasy and ultimately disappointment to be broken and forgotten when playtime ended. The amount of love given was only equal to the child's usefulness. Gormley had learned that lesson early in his youth, and it had made him tough and cruel. It had made him exceptional. Because of the remoteness of his property and his disagreeable comportment, Gormley didn't get many visitors. He liked it that way. Often he would go days without seeing anybody at all, except for the postman. And the postman was only ever seen from Gormley's single front window. The postman both excited and disgusted Gormley. His father had been a postman. That fact alone was enough to spawn a black aversion to any and all postal workers. And for years, even long after the old man died, 
looking at a mail carrier made Gormley ill. Every time he did, he would hear the rusty screech of his father's truck. He would smell the beer-tinged halitosis all over again. What are you doing, boy? What are you doing? I told you not to touch yourself like that, boy, you nasty little bastard. He would hear echoes of garbled curses and shouts. What's wrong with you, boy? Don't you understand? He would feel the shoves, the slaps, and the punches. What will happen when you touch that nasty little thing? What's wrong with you? Before Gormley started his crusade, the postman delivered him nothing but pain. But this, as it turned out, was a blessing in disguise, and Gormley was perceptive enough to see it. Through his work, he'd turned the thing he hated most into his personal lapdog. The postman came almost every day. It was his job to come, and he would take Gormley's letters off and deliver them. He had to. To every stupid, soft, happy, sappy family. The postman was weak. A sheep. A zombie. An instrument. The postman had no power over Gormley now. It was he who was the puppet master. No, the preacher. No, the savior of the world. And if the world couldn't learn from him, then, as far as Gormley was concerned, it deserved to suffer blindly in darkness. But today, today the postman was terribly late, and Gormley was beginning to worry. Maybe the authorities were monitoring his mail. Maybe they were fitting the postman with high-definition cameras and microphones. Gormley hadn't been caught and punished for doing something bad since he was a child. He learned to be careful. Never once had he even received a response from a vengeful, grieving parent. Of course, he never revealed his identity. But you never know how somebody can find you out nowadays. His saliva could have been pulled from all the stamps and envelopes. It could have been collected in a vial in some refrigerated vault somewhere deep below the Pentagon. Perhaps the authorities were just biding time, amassing evidence. Gormley had done nothing really wrong, of course. He'd never killed anybody. He'd never touched any children. Gormley didn't know too much about the law, but whatever they could charge him with, he knew they couldn't just send him to prison, even if they did drag him to trial. Uh, over what? A few letters? A few hard truths? He'd have the opportunity to preach his cold gospel to the world. And the court here intends to prove that this man is responsible for sending these letters to these poor grieving parents. I haven't done anything wrong. Don't you see? I'm helping these people. I'm helping them. I'm helping them to get over their grief. What have you done to help with their grief? What have you done? What have any of you done for them? I've brought their pain back, yeah. I've made them feel everything. But then I helped them move on to get past it. The filthy smiles, the happiness, they need to get past it, don't you understand? They need to get by it. They need to understand what this world is really about. What demons really lurk in this world. And his arguments would be so convincing that the lawyers and the judge and the jury 
and the families in the courtroom, and the journalists, and all the people at home watching on TV would open their collective eyes to reality. Everyone would finally see the real, cold, hard truth. Then, people would start acting accordingly. Then the world and everyone in it would start getting real instead of play acting in the same sick, tired old farce. Would getting caught really be so bad then? Gormley considered this for a moment. Probably. Probably, yes. People are stupid. They simply wouldn't understand. Gormley couldn't go to prison. He wasn't as tough as he had been in his youth, not physically anyway, and prison was full of men much tougher than he. No, getting caught was out of the question. He'd sooner die. Gormley's stomach ached. Too much caffeine and sugar. Too much worry. He debated walking to the mailbox, taking the letter, and trying again the next day. Perhaps he would write another draft after a short nap. But if he were being watched, retrieving a letter from his mailbox would appear quite suspicious to prying eyes. Would it not? Another thought occurred to him. What if one of the real abductors had learnt of his letters? What if some psychopath child killer was out there lurking in the fog, wearing a bloody postman's uniform and waiting for Gormley to take that long, lonely walk to his mailbox? Surely, at least a few maniacs resented his taking credit for their deeds. Gormley wrung his hands. He scurried to his door to check the locks. His trailer creaked on its cinder block legs. The fog outside had lifted. It had turned from hyperborean gray to dingy yellow. Was it really so late in the day? Gormley swiped his phone from the nightstand. It was dead. He'd checked it not long ago. That's how he was so sure the postman was late and it had been fully charged. His old desktop didn't fire up either. He pulled the chain on a nearby lamp and no light emerged from behind the shade. It was a blackout. Perhaps they were working on the line somewhere out there. Perhaps it was the police, and in an instant they were going to kick his door down and blast him with tear gas. Or perhaps, and was a madman with an axe. Such speculation was no good. It provoked far too much anxiety. Gormley considered the fact that he hadn't actually talked to another human being in a week or two. He'd barely left the trailer, save to check the mail, and his diet had been especially terrible during the time he was focused on his letters. It was the isolation and the caffeine and the lack of sleep making him worry. It was all of that. And the damned postman. Today of all days he was late. It just all felt too inauspicious. Was it getting darker? Gormley pulled a candle from a drawer. It couldn't have been later than 10 a.m. Was his vision failing? Too much time in the dark in front of a computer screen? He returned to his kitchen head, lit the candle, and placed it on the table in front of him. The world beyond the flame in the solitary window had grown ever darker. It appeared to be dusk though there was no way of discerning the sun's position in the fog, which had thickened just as quickly as the daylight had waned. It rolled over Gormley's property, 
obscuring his view of the mailbox and blank sheets of oblivion. I must be tired. The phrase repeated itself in his head over and over. His mind and body swung from nervous tension to outright lethargy. I must be tired. I got a lot down. He wasn't sure of what he was telling himself, but he slowly rose to his feet with the candle. Reluctantly breaking his gaze on the shrouded world outside, and he shuffled to his room at the opposite end of the trailer. He observed how quiet it was. There was only the groan of his footsteps. There were no birds or furry little things scampering through the trees outside. Even if the day was really over, the usual hum of night insects was strangely absent. It was sound dampening technology, it had to be. They were screwing with him, watching him from the woods. He was almost sure of it. But who were they? Do maniacs have access to the kind of engineering necessary for this sort of production? Gormley banished the thought from his mind. He slipped into his bed and piled the covers around him. It was the police. They were trying to break him. Well, they didn't know whom they were harassing. First thing in the morning, he'd go to town. He'd mail his letter personally. Then he'd go to the police station and confront them. He'd force them to play their hand. And... And what? Then he'd go to jail? Certainly not. Certainly not that. So what then? Well, he'd think of it. He'd think of something. Perhaps to a lawyer first. Yes, a lawyer. He had options. He wasn't a poor man. And he certainly wasn't a fool. Yes, he'd mail his letter. Then, talk to a lawyer. Then, but his letter. He'd have to get his letter. He'd have to get out of bed. He'd have to leave his trailer. He'd have to walk that long walk down to the mailbox in the darkness and fog. I can stay in the box overnight. No harm in that. Just one night. And if the postman comes before I'm up, that saves me a trip. Gormley flopped from one side to the other and faced the wall. The candle's flicker cast odd shadows and stretched his own deformed silhouette across the false wood paneling. His eyes were weighty and felt dry and raw. He'd hoped to end his day in the same manner he always did after a successful missive assault. By fantasizing about some little child's mother or father... Opening his envelope and reading his letter. He would imagine the color draining from their faces, the tears welling in their eyes, the wailing and gnashing of teeth. Gormley cursed his anonymity. He wanted the parents to write him back. One time, he had chanced upon the mother of one of his lost children responding on TV to the letter he'd sent. The failure in her words, the stupidity in her voice, it was all so predictably perfect. Gormley had downloaded the video clip from the show and replayed it often when he felt the urge to do impure things. Gormley fell asleep. Swirling dreams rushed through his agitated brain with foggy visions of crying mothers, smiling children, SWAT teams and serial killers, and of course, the Pope.
postman, his wretched slave. <laughs> Make that face of me, boy. I swear to God, I'll Dad, break your fucking no, scrawn in the neck. No, you and your fucking mother's the no, same. Sorry, You're just the same. Worthless piece of no, shit. Sorry, Dad. No, you you not like know, Daddy. No, no. <laughs> He awoke at an unfamiliar time to a hard, single knock at his door. His candle had burned itself out, but he could see scant light coming from the kitchenette window at the trailer's opposite end. He sat nervously in a dull room. It was as if he hadn't slept a wink. Another hard, hammering knock at the door. A battering ram. Or worse, an axe. Then Gormley heard something in the silence outside. Someone was moving from the front door to his side of the trailer in excruciatingly slow, plodding steps. There was also a scraping, sliding noise advancing across the metal exterior. Something pressed heavily against the trailer causing it to sigh like the hull of an ancient ship set adrift in the fog. And Gormley could hear the breathing, the slow, labored breathing of clogged, elderly lungs. The movement stopped just outside of Gormley's bedroom. The wall creaked vaguely, and the breathing grew louder. The visitor outside was listening, pressing their head to the wall. Gormley held his breath. He tightened his blanket against his chest to muffle the sound of his heartbeat. Untold time passed while Gormley sat paralyzed by the croaking rhythm of the breathing outside. Then the panting rose to a furor and the insidious invisible presence spoke in low, sustained, dripping tones. Francis Gormley! Come on out here! Got a package for you, boy! The voice was a mockery of something recognizable. It was glottal and reptilian, conjuring up a pallid but unmistakable memory. Gormley's leaden heart began to sink. He wet himself. And the caffeine was to blame. After a moment, the owner of the voice outside started a slow, creeping limp back toward the front door. Gormley considered barricading it, but he doubted he had time. Whoever it was outside had heavy fists and could have battered the door down with minimal effort. A kitchen knife was the only accessible means of defense. The stranger was almost to the door. Gormley shook free from vacillation and nearly tripped over the blanket as he tore out of his room. His heavy footsteps shook the floor. Just as he passed the threshold, another solid thump on the door froze him in place. Francis! The anger in the stranger's voice was palpable. Get out here, boy. I got deliveries. Can't be out here all damn night. His final word was punctuated with another powerful knock. The aluminum surface of the door was undoubtedly dented, and Gormley heard the splintering of cheap wood. For the first time since a childhood of drunken words and drunken hands ossified in his memory, despite every attempt to forget, Gormley felt the urge to cry. 
to scream for help. But who would help him? Gormley tried to speak, and it took more effort than he'd anticipated. His voice came out in cracks and squeaks. I can't, I can't be bothered just now. Come back tomorrow. The trespasser's heavy gasps mutated into a sickening chuckle. <laughs> be back tomorrow to be sure, boy. <laughs> Gormley heard the intruder turn and begin to stagger away. Gormley ran to the cutlery drawer and rummaged for the largest knife he could find. It was dreadfully dark outside and the light that seeped in through the window belonged to a pair of fog lights at the end of the driveway. Gormley squinted and spied the tall, hunched, bleary shape of a man in a rounded postman's hat hobbling back towards the source of the lights. The man was moving so slowly that his lame steps seemed to take place in a kind of bizarre time-lapse photography. Upon reaching the end of the drive, the figure, bathed in the fog lights, turned to Gormley's mailbox and lingered. Leave! Just leave! Gormley whispered aggressively. He wanted to repeat himself more loudly and forcefully, but before he could utter them again, the man turned back as though he'd already heard. I hear you. At once the fog lights intensified, taking the shape of two huge, bulging, orb like eyes, and the face of the postman appeared in full view directly outside the window. The ghastly being curled its thin lips and gaped at him with a riven, rotten-toothed mouth that billowed fog in foul expiration. Mottled yellow-gray skin hung from a skull wreathed in patches of dead, white hair. The postman's fog-light eyes flashed and burned as he let out a protracted scream. Then, the moldy jaws clenched and he ground his jagged teeth together in a hateful, decayed grimace. At that moment, a blinding white sting hit Gormley directly in his eyes. He clutched at his face and fell away from the window, tumbling over the table and back first onto the linoleum floor. Gormley screamed. The razor-thin edge of some spectral blade had slashed deep into each eyeball. His hands were warm and wet with tears and blood and something else. Something thicker. He could feel it oozing down his face and puddling the floor. Pain was excruciating, like the worst paper cut imaginable in the most delicate and sensitive of places. The angry, feculent voice of the postman hissed. You're gonna lose more than your eyes, Francis. I'm coming tomorrow, and I'm gonna take your fat little fingers, and then I'll come the next night 
and take your tongue. I'll split it right down the middle, boy. And then, then there'll be no more bad words from you. Postman's horrid laughter resounded inside the trailer. Gormley felt the stinking, humid breath on his face. It was a sickly familiar mixture of soil, stale beer, and rotten fish. Then suddenly, nothing. Silence for what felt like an eternity. At last, Gormley heard the mail truck pull out onto the blacktop road with a rusty screech and slowly drive away, taking the darkness with it. Gormley heard the pleasant sounds of the day, the birds and the furry little animals busying themselves amongst the trees, but Gormley's nightmare remained. Fear overrode the pain in his lacerated eyes. The postman would come back. He was sure of it. And who knew how long the day would last? Time meant nothing now. Gormley had to get out. He had to find people. Perhaps prison wasn't such a bad option. Maybe they'd take pity on a blind man. At the very least, he wouldn't be alone. Gormley pulled himself to his feet and groped for the door. He had to put a shoulder to it to get it to open. And when it did, he tripped over a large object at his feet. He felt that it was a package, wrapped in paper. He was afraid to open it, but he shook it and could distinguish the unmistakable rustling of envelopes within. Then the faint sounds of laughing children surrounded him. Gormley's throat felt constricted and sour, and he wished he'd had a peppermint. He picked up the package, and with great trepidation, made his way to the blacktop road at the end of the drive. <laughs> Gormley pointed himself toward town and wandered off blindly in the vaporous morning fog. Life Near the Bone, written by Billy Sue Mossiman, performed by Todd Farrell. Where do you think life's sweetest? Jeff Castain stood next to overflowing shelves with a book open in his hands. Where? Deep inside a woman who's stacked like a movie star. Let's say she owns an exercise gym. <laughs> yeah, that's where it's sweetest. Jeff's roommate was bent over at the waist, towel-drying freshly shampooed hair. It says right here, Jeff said, ignoring Greg's worthless comment, pointing to a page in the book, it is life near the bone where it is sweetest. I believe that. Near the bone? What's that supposed to mean? Unless it's the pelvic bone he's talking about. <laughs> he chuckled at his own sexist wit. Henry David Thoreau said this, but I don't think he was talking about a woman's anatomy. Still, I don't get it. It's all mumbo-jumbo to me. Greg slung the damp towel over the back of a slouch-backed easy chair and plopped down in it. He hiked up one foot onto the lip of the cushion and began pulling at his toenails, ripping them off in slivers one by one. Jeff moved from the bookcases and lay down on the sofa. 
He propped the book on his chest so as to block the view of his roommate's disgusting hygiene habits. Filthy man, he thought. I'll have to go behind him and sweep the nails from the carpet and put them in the trash. It's like picking up baby shit. Doesn't he know that? Is Thoreau your philosopher of choice this week? Greg asked. It was obvious by Greg's tone of voice he didn't care about the answer. Jeff almost failed to respond, but then decided he had taken quite enough sarcasm for one night, friend or no friend. I think that's unfair, he said. I don't go around picking philosophies the way someone collects porcelain dogs, or the way you collect those stupid arty-farty posters. Greg paused in the ripping off of a bit of ragged nail from his big toe. He frowned over at the supine Jeff. Low blow. Okay, maybe I'm just being an asshole. Sorry. Quote all the Thoreau you want. What do I care? <laughs> Thanks for giving your divine permission. Jeff sulked behind Thoreau's Walden and would not say anything else. All during the following day, Jeff read and pondered Thoreau's book. No matter how ringing and clear and intriguing the pages he read, he kept coming back to that one quote, nagging at it, taking it apart and putting it together again, trying to make it solely his property. How does one get near enough to the bone so that life would be sweet? There stood the question, this towering, incomprehensible question that might drive him mad if he let it. For life at this juncture was sour and smelling of decay. A desperate air clung to him, fumed off his clothes no matter how often he changed them. It rolled off him in waves from his pores. He decided that must be the reason the job interviews went badly. They could detect his desperation, maybe smell it the way he did, that fetid stench of rotting peaches left in neglect on a drain board for a month. Not his fault he'd lost his job. Houston had been good for him when he'd first moved there from the moribund Gary, Indiana. These were boom times, and jobs were for the picking, and money flowed faster than a flooding bayou. But feast always gave way to famine, and so it was for the city that boasted itself the jewel of the Southwest. He had clung to his managerial position at the Boston Whaler dealership for as long as he could. Why blame him for a loss of sales and a slumping profit margin? But they did, and he was out and he was not coming in until he could find a job more rewarding than shoveling burgers out of a jack-in-the-box, thank you, Charlie Brown. You wouldn't catch him demeaning himself for minimum wage. He still had. He glanced at his fingers, and from a bald fist flicked out one finger at a time, counting the weeks. Six weeks before his unemployment check was cut off. He'd find something worthwhile before then, wouldn't he? The possibility that he might never find work again left a little knot of fear tingling in his belly. He began to perspire, to smell himself. Needed a shower. Needed to think. Think about getting to the bone where life was sweet again, where it wouldn't matter fate had turned, where he might again discover his lost self-respect. Around three in the afternoon, just before Greg came home from work at Bayshore Hospital, Jeff found a clue in Thoreau. It was like encountering an old, long-lost friend, for immediately he remembered part of the quote from high school literature books. Our life is frittered away by detail. Simplify. Simplify. So that's how it's done, Jeff realized. That's how you get down to the pure, gleaming skeleton of existence and find peace. So obvious. He had been trying too hard, running too fast, and complicating his world unnecessarily. Simplify. What are you doing? Isn't it apparent? I'm ridding my life of detail and clutter. Greg turned down the volume on the television where a married couple was sparring on a sitcom. He went to Jeff and stooped near him on the floor by the stereo. What are you going to do with those albums? The dumpster. It's all for the trash, man. But Jeff, you've had some of those albums since we were in college together. Why would you get rid of them now? Some you'll never find again, not in the original. Jeff paused and looked at the cover of an early Jimi Hendrix album. This one had belonged to his older sister. 
May she find peace in her sumptuous, overcomplicated, frivolous life. He placed it with some care on top of the other albums in a cardboard box. It wasn't worth a weary sigh, really. Just junk. Really, he wouldn't miss it. I don't want them anymore. I've lugged stuff around for years. That's the point, Greg. I'm through with all that. I'm simplifying my life. But... Jeff dumped the rest of the albums into the box and smiled beatifically at his friend before going to the shelves lining the far wall. He turned his back and began pulling out volumes and stacking them in piles on the floor at his feet. Now what are you up to? More clutter. Got to go. Your library! Greg squeaked, coming to his feet. Don't need it. It's just littering the place up. Books are dust catchers. Everything I own does nothing for me but gather dust. Now, Jeff, you know I don't give a good goddamn about books. I wouldn't read one if my life depended on it. But you read all the time. If you throw all these books out, what are you going to read? Jeff just said one word. Thoreau. And continued hauling the bound titles from the shelves to stacks on the floor. Greg grabbed up Henry Miller's Tropic of Cancer and held it to his chest. Jeff, I don't understand any of this. You love books. You're a glutton for books. How can you give them up this way? And your music? I don't know what this means. Jeff turned all in a rush. He flourished two thick books by Dostoevsky in front of Greg's face. Garbage! Greg, startled, backed immediately out of range. Can't you get it? Haven't you been listening to me? Sudden rage spiraled upward like a tornado swirling between the two friends. Thoreau says that luxuries and comforts of life are not indispensable. They're hindrances to the elevation of mankind. Can't you see that? Are you blind as well as deaf? Are you a total fucking mindless vegetable? Greg carefully replaced the Miller book on top of one of the stacks and slunk away to the far side of the living room where he took up a watchful pose in the easy chair. He began to chew his fingernails to still the quake inside his chest. It didn't seem to bring an instant of relief. Greg stumbled home from a double shift at the hospital, so tired even his eyeballs ached. He saw that his framed posters had disappeared from the wall behind the television set. At any other time, this would have served to make him go into a rant, but he was too tired to do more than search for Jeff and ask for an explanation. He would put in a mild protest and retrieve the posters, hang them again. At Jeff's bedroom door, he paused on the threshold. Jeff stood emptying his chest of drawers into a glad trash bag. While his back was to the door, Greg glanced quickly around. The Navajo rug his friend had bought on a visit to Santa Fe had been rolled in a corner. The covers on the bed were missing, except for one rumpled sheet and a bare pillow. The lampshade, the lampshade, crumpled on the floor, looked stomped. This frightened Greg more than any of the other evidence that his friend was losing it. Greg couldn't guess the import of the shade, unless Jeff meant to live in the unprotected glare of a light bulb. This was decidedly going too far. He must intervene the way they taught at the hospital outpatient alcohol clinics. Sometimes people had to intervene and risk getting their asses kicked if they saw someone they loved descending into perilous territory. Now Jeff was methodically discarding clothes. Would he go naked? Jeff finally chose to keep two rather than three pairs of jockey shorts. All he needed was a change while one was washed and drying. He bundled up the rest of the underwear into his arms, ready to stuff it all into the rapidly filling bag. He saw Greg in the door. Hey there, you know what? I've been thinking about you pulling those double shifts. It's crazy, man. It's unenlightened. I told you what Thoreau said about luxuries and comforts. Wanting things is a trap. Once inside the trap, you never get free. The jaws lock down tight. Here you are working 16 hours straight so you can afford that Camaro you just bought, and those nights on the town with your girl, and... Jeff? Yeah? He tamped down the clothes on the glad bag, grinning all the while. What did you do with my posters? Oh, those. I put them in your room. 
You really should think about doing away with that kind of stuff. It just drags you down. Drags you down. Jeff, I think it's time you saw someone. Dr. Bronski over at Bayshore is pretty good. I'll get him to give you a professional discount and- Fuck you! Vehement. Aggressive. Even Jeff's good-natured temper was rapidly vanishing. Come on, Jeff, I'm serious. This is getting way out of hand. Look at you. You're throwing away your clothes, for Christ's sakes. Not everything. I'm keeping two pairs of jeans and two shirts. That's all I need. What do I need all these clothes for? For starters, maybe you'd need them for a job? For going to interviews to get a job? Go away. Jeff turned his back, pulled out the bottom drawer of his chest, and hauled out folded summer shorts and sports shirts. I can't, Jeff. I have to try to do something. Jeff halted in his pawing through the drawer. He said quietly, If you don't go away right now, I won't be responsible for what happens. Are you threatening me now? I hear a different drummer, Greg. If you don't hear it, fine, but don't interfere. Now go away. Jeff didn't want to go, but he didn't want to stay either. He waited only until his friend turned slowly, ominously, and he saw the look of a nervous zealot, the mad, staring look of a monk holding a flame, ready to immolate himself with the cleansing holy fire. Then he knew he must leave. There was nothing he could do. Jeff had ventured too far over the edge, and he was falling without a net. He had to call from the living room, too fearful to tell Jeff anything to his face ever again. I'm moving out, Jeff. He waited. Do you hear me? I'm going to pack my shit and I'm out of here. You're sick, Jeff. I'm not staying with you any longer when you won't listen to me, when you won't go for help. You're dangerous. Don't you realize that? You've been throwing away stuff for a week. Fuck you, he heard Jeff call back furiously. Fuck you and the Gucci Rolex BMW Beverly Hills horse you rode in on. I don't need you around anyway. You're nothing but a prostitute. You sold out the day you were born. Jeff Castain gradually came to enjoy life again. It seemed as if he had been on a quest for the grail and found it embedded in the pure, clean stone of Thoreau's noble philosophy. He had been walking through trash, stumbling, lost, and now he could see the path before him. He read, Some circumstantial evidence is very strong, as when you find a trout in the milk. From this he deduced that Greg's leaving was ordained. It helped him unearth order in a disorderly universe. He had never loved him or anything, not truly. They were just friends for a while, and who turned out to be a traitor to all that was good and right and just? So what if he proved to be the asshole of the world, the turncoat, the philistine? The apartment was shaping up, looking good. He rubbed his palms together in contentment. In the living room he'd gotten rid of everything but one kitchen straight-backed chair, an unadorned fruit crate from the Safeway, and his precious copy of Walden. In the kitchen he'd thrown out everything but one plate, one knife, one pan. He ate from cans mostly, so what was the point of owning dinnerware and drawers full of silverware and cabinets full of cooking utensils? He saw his landlady scuttle to the dumpster and take the electric grill and the popcorn popper. Crazy old bitch. Frivolous, frowsy pack rat. His bedroom was a spare cell now, and he loved it. It was a hell of a chore to lug the bed from the apartment down the stairs and out back to the dumpster. But, sweating and swearing, he'd managed. The floor was immensely more comfortable after a few nights. He hardly ached at all anymore when he woke. He thought the Spartan idea converged well with Thoreau's philosophy, so he incorporated it into his new life modality. He had the phone company disconnect his telephone at week's end. Greg kept calling in the job agencies, too. What a fucking nuisance. What a bore. He didn't need a job. His needs were too few to demand a real income. When the unemployment check ran out, he'd apply for welfare. If they wouldn't let him have it, he'd go on the streets. It meant nothing to him one way or the other. Thoreau said, I never found the companion that was so companionable as solitude. 
Jeff embraced that to mean he must let the world flow past. In the apartment, on the street, wherever he found himself, it didn't matter. He carried solitude with him like an envelope in his pocket, and no one could divest him of it ever again. They didn't even know he had it. He patted his shirt pocket as if solitude really was a thing of dimension and weight, and it belonged to him alone. It was not until a month later that Jeff found the quote that would change his life and get him down to the nub of existence. He'd still been searching for the place next to the bone, scraping and scraping away society's frills until he could feel the knife screeching somewhere far off in the dim nether reaches of the fog that had come to surround his days. There are a thousand hacking at the branches of evil, to one who is striking at the root. That is what he came upon in his diligent study, and when he found it, he knew then he was nearly home free through the twilight of his ignorance. He heard clarion bells ringing on the reading aloud of that sentence. He shivered with anticipation at the coming understanding that crept forth from the dark corner shadows of his barren apartment. That understanding, when it took him, would rend the foundations of his misery and bring him down to the bone, down past the slime and corruption, the gate of flesh that barred the way. Hello, Mrs. Whipshaw. Jeff, how nice of you to visit. Won't you come in? The old woman who had nabbed the grill and the popcorn popper from the trash dumpster let her tenant inside the dank, bird-shit-splattered living room. A white cockatiel flew through the air in protest, wings flapping wildly. Pay no attention to Pado. He's a spoiled brat and isn't used to polite company. Hush, Pado. Behave now. Jeff declined to sit in the newspaper-covered chintz chair Mrs. Whipshaw gestured he'd take. He stood with his hands behind his back, smiling the stiff smile of the Buddha, the smile of the inscrutable. His gaze flicked around the room, and soon his smile evaporated, replaced by a sneer of disgust. White smears of Pato's crap covered the drapes, dripped down the neck of a brass table lamp, lay in dried yellow streaked plops on top of the furniture. It looked as if an insane painter had come and, in a frenzy, swung a wet brush around and around to create a barbarous nightmare of interior decoration. I haven't seen you out of your apartment in ever so long, Mrs. Whipshaw said, shooing the contentious bird from her shoulder. Jeff watched the cockatiel closely to see where it might light down. It hung upside down from the silent, dust-layered ceiling fan and screeched at him, one eye cocked in his direction. I haven't been out much, Jeff said, once reassured the bird was not coming to him. He felt a nausea rising and had to swallow bitter gorge. It tasted of the kidney beans he'd consumed the night before. Sickening, eating, an odious habit, made people into worms, scoop it in, shit it out, round and round she goes, where she stops no one knows. What happened to your nice friend, that Greg boy? Did he really move out? Posters, Jeff said by way of explanation. What's that, dear? Jeff crossed the room, his eye trained on the bird, as he came for Mrs. Whipshaw, with the one knife he'd saved for cutting through meat. Disposing of the bodies. Now, Thoreau never gave advice about that sort of thing. Damn odd. He knew about everything else. You'd think the man would have left some sort of road map. Jeff had to ponder the situation for two days before he could decide what to do. He had Mrs. Whipshaw and Pato cooling in the huge freezer she kept, strangely enough, in the spare bedroom of her ground-floor apartment. He had the occupant of the other downstairs apartment, punky-looking George with the orange and green blotch in his hair, stuffed over double at the waist in his broom closet. Cluttered. Cluttered. Baseball mitts, bats, skates, pool cues, bowling balls, smelly running shoes. Much too cluttered for anyone sane. He had James, the quiet law student, in the bathtub in the apartment on the second floor. He sat shriveling like an old potato with a radio in his lap. Pity it wasn't a law manual, though what good that would do him now, Jeff couldn't guess. 
He had the Danju sisters waiting in their beds. Nice girls, not a bother in the world, but the way they lived, unbelievable. Frozen dinner trays growing mold, magazines littering the carpet, thready dust balls and trailing spider webs and filmy bikini panties hanging everywhere. It was enough litter to turn the stomach. It took Jeff all night just to get their apartment under some kind of control. He cursed them with every name in the book, nice girls or not. Anyone living like a pig needed to be called a swine. Old Man Shore was no trouble at all. He was all bent and crippled by arthritis. He couldn't run. He couldn't even crawl, not toward the last. Cried, though. Cried like a fucking baby. And him, old as the hills, didn't make proper good sense to Jeff, but there it was. A man who chose to live with a cat that scratched out shitball litter every time it used the box had to be some kind of nut to begin with. Everyone knew you could get terminal diseases from cats. Jeff had saved Shore a prolonged and no doubt much more painful death. Now to dispose of the bodies, without Thoreau's help, without his wisdom and guidance, and to return the apartment house, the entire building, to neat, impersonal harmony. It would take boxes and boxes of glad trash bags, dozens of cardboard boxes from the Safeway, a wheelbarrow. Yes, he would need a wheelbarrow. He hoped the dumpster wasn't full tonight. He would be taking numerous loads to it. His heart sang with freedom. He was at last seeing the very edge of the pristine bone, a flicker of purity, and it was a glorious glimpse of paradise. Heaven itself. He heard the pounding of feet coming up the stairs before he ever heard knocking on the door. He was tired, sweaty, needed a shower, cold and long. He peeked through the viewer and saw the intruder into his place of calm and peace was the treasonous poster man, Greg. Figured. Jeff? Greg called, his face pressed against the door. Let me in. Jeff unbolted the lock and swung wide the door, turning away and walking across the room as he did so. Jeff? There was a pregnant pause. Then, what the hell? What did he do with all the furniture? Jesus! Jeff wore only a pair of grimy shorts. His hair stuck out on end as he'd been sleeping and not washing. He was covered with dirt and smudges that looked like tar or oil. What do you want now? I've been worried about you. I tried to call, but the operator told me the phone was disconnected. So? Well, uh, how are you? What do you care? You've amused for a decadent lifestyle, didn't you? You want to be featured on The Rich and Famous one day, don't you? So why would you care? Greg cleared his throat. He looked like a weasel caught in a hole. The criticism, however exaggerated, was a little too close to home. Did you... did you find work? Jeff chortled unpleasantly. <laughs> Go away, Greg. I have nothing to say to you. He left the room and disappeared into the darkened hallway. Greg followed close behind. Jeff, wait. I really mean it. I'm still worried. How are you paying the rent? Are you eating? I could help, you know. I haven't really abandoned you. No rent. Mrs. Whipshaw said so. Dear old lady, dear bird lady. Jeff went directly into the hall bath and stepped in the tub. He slipped out of his shorts and threw them on the floor. He turned on the shower, drew the curtain. No rent. Rent free, Jeff said above the roar of the water. Ask her yourself. Maybe I will. The shower curtain snapped open and droplets of water flew in the air, spotting Greg's face. No, you won't. Don't you dare. You stay out of my business affairs. You're no longer in my life, remember? You wanted your fucking posters and your soft cushions and your steak and potatoes, remember? Jeff, can't you talk with me without fighting? Can't you see your way clear to be reasonable? Jeff shut the curtain. He suds down his body and scrubbed himself hard with the washcloth. Finally, he said, in as sane and sensible a tone as he could muster, Let me through, and I'll take you on a tour of my new orderly world. Full of misgivings, 
Greg lowered the toilet seat and sat down to wait. This time, he had to do something before he left. This time, it was absolutely imperative he not leave Jeff alone with his warped delusions. He had known him too long not to try to help. Jeff finished bathing, dried, dressed himself quickly in jeans and a shirt and sneakers. I've seen the place, Jeff. You got rid of everything. It looks like a prison. Hmm, not a prison. A sanctuary. A man has to begin at home. Then, he glanced slyly at Greg. He branches out. I don't think you're going to find very many followers. Not many people want to join a cult that denies all possession. Greg laughed easily, but soon quieted when Jeff walked past him to the front door. Come on, I want to show you how I've hacked at the chaos and brought it under supervision. I want to show you what can be done when you simplify your life. When all the extraneous is ruthlessly cut away down to the very roots where the trouble lies. Jeff took his friend to Mrs. Whipshaw's freezer first thing. They walked together through the scrupulously cleaned, empty apartment to the spare room. When the stunned, horrified remonstration began, it was a beast of a battle to get Greg subdued enough to shut his mouth. To shut his mouth forever. Less than a week passed after Greg's visit before Jeff wandered through the silenced apartment house in the middle of the night, saying goodbye to his perfectly balanced world. People had come to inquire. Mrs. Whipshaw's son screamed that he'd be back with the police. He would see his mother, goddammit, if he had to bring the National Guard to do it. She never would have left town without telling him, he claimed from the bottom of the apartment steps. Don't tell him she would. The boyfriend of one of the Danju sisters left without a squawk, but as he went to his car, he kept squinting suspiciously over his shoulder. Two law students stopped by to ask why their friend had not been to classes. Sick? They hadn't heard from him. Too sick to call them? Contagious. Wasn't that funny, though? He always seemed in such good health. Yes, it was time to go, as much as he hated to. He had invested a ridiculous amount of time in creating order, in simplifying the complex. It was a shame, terribly unjust, that he must flee what was an almost perfect creation. Yet, an apartment house in the center of a seedy district inside of an abhorrently chaotic big city was no real place for him anyway. He needed his own Walden Pond. He needed to escape to the wilds, sequester himself away from the mad, chattering, bruising world. With the money Greg and the apartment dwellers had on persons or in their possession, Jeff took a bus from Houston to the dry West Texas town of Midland. Once there, he hired a taxi driver to take him into the desert. Where? Where no one lives, Jeff said, waving money in the man's face. <laughs> are you nuts? How are you going to get back? No phone there, buddy. Nothing but snakes and tumbleweeds, sand and cactus. You can't go out there. A friend's meeting me later in his car, if it's any of your business. I'll come back with him. Now will you drive? He drove. For two hours. Blabbering all the way, bitching about the heat, the absurdity of this, the kooks he ran into. What a job. Jeff ignored him in favor of a reading, for the dozenth time, from Walden. He knew exactly what he was doing. He knew where the bone glistened most cleanly. It was not in the woods where Thoreau had hidden away himself. It was not in the mountains where shady, towering presences safeguarded the timorous. It was not in the lush valleys where nature rioted and the senses were overwhelmed. It was in the plain, open desert. The place man had not yet desecrated with his two-bit palaces and his glittering signs and his bubbling, stinking tarmac laid end to end forever and amen. It was here, in the steaming heart of untrodden, forgotten land, that Jeff Castain knew he would find the ultimate simplification. He wanted that more than breath itself. This buddy of yours don't show up in time? You could have a sunstroke out here without water. I tell you, this is the craziest thing I've ever seen, the cabbie complained. I don't like it, none a bit. I ain't gonna be responsible for you dying out here, you know. A hundred and five in the shade, if there was any shade. I've been trying to talk you out of this, ain't that right? 
Jeff failed to answer except to say, Pull over here. This is where I get out. Even before the taxi made a U-turn on the infrequently traveled two-lane highway, Jeff was already heading off across the hard-packed sands. He moved west toward the lowering sun, Thoreau's book clutched tightly in hand. Heat mirages blinked on and off in the distance, like defective pale blue neon tubes. A lone vulture rode the high currents, a dot in the scalding blue sky. Here was Seoul. Here was where eternity sat down to shake hands with creatures courageous enough to come unfettered. Jeff Castain looked back only once to make certain he was losing sight of the long black strip of highway, to make sure he was leaving civilization behind. He thought now it had never belonged to him. That world was under rule of someone else, someone other, alien. He lost all sense of time when day segued into night, into day, into night. He stumbled and dropped the book, picked it up, surprised to see his hands blistered black. But never mind, never mind. Finally, his tongue swelled in his mouth and hung over his cracked lips like a fat gray slug. His lungs, a fiery bellows, labored to keep him going. His eyes had swollen to slits, blocking the blood-red disk of the sun. His skin, his clothes at some past time discarded, seeped clear fluid from pustules that he split apart with pinched fingers. Each passing second he could feel the loosening of the hold the world had on the flesh. He was a dragon whose scales fell clattering at his feet. Each faltering, dragging step he managed to take brought him ever nearer the crux of reality, ever closer to the bone. He yearned. He begged. He prayed. In the end, he raged. Didn't I sacrifice enough? He yelled across the endless sand. Didn't I scrape past all the filth? He pulled on a sack of skin until he tore off pieces and had ripped an ear from his skull. He went to his knees and screamed soundlessly. At last he could hear a velvety voice hissing across the still air as it approached. He was almost home, it said. He bowed his head in relief and wept bloody tears. Come, it said, nearer, it said, where life is simple, life is true, where no one knows you, no one cares, and nothing can get you back again. Come now, where you belong, it said, ever closer. Come with me, where life is sweetest, near the bone, near the white, white bone. Watchtowers of Carthage Key, written by Chris Mallory, narrated by Rock Manor. Featuring Rebecca Peason. Mainland Florida disappeared behind the horizon, leaving my girlfriend, her son, and me surrounded by the open Atlantic. I revved the boat engine, enjoying the warm wind and the ripples of sunlight dancing on the crystal clear water. Jordan tugged on the back of my shirt. Where are we going? I told you, exploring. Now go bother your mother. Hey! He kicked my leg. Lindsay sat up in the hammock. Beads of ocean spray glistened on her oiled mocha skin. <sighs> Cut it out, boys. Mama's busy working on her tan. Yeah, yeah. We'll be there soon anyway. But where? Jordan shook his hands above his head. I shrugged. Truth was, the place we were going didn't have a name. 
hundreds of small islands dot the Floridian coast. Most of them are uninhabited and undedicated. Seeking a fun way to bond with Jordan, I had searched the maps online for one to visit. I ultimately chose a spot farther off the coast than I had originally wanted to travel because I was intrigued by the large structures that appeared to stretch along its sandy beaches like a row of dominoes. Staring at the computer monitor, I hadn't been sure whether the shadows were playing tricks on my eyes. I checked around the web and couldn't find anything about the place, except a crude drawing of the general region with the joke caption written in pirate text. Here there be monsters. Honestly, I didn't expect much to come from the excursion. At the very least, I thought, checking out the small bit of land would be a good day trip. Lindsay loved to sunbathe, and Jordan always enjoyed adding to his seashell collection. And even if those structures turned out to be geological, I wasn't going to get upset. The island itself didn't matter. I just wanted to spend time with two people I cared about. A sense of adventure had washed over me the moment we left the marina. Once Florida was out of sight, I set the course to the unnamed island and took in all the beauty the sea had to offer. Man, it's a nice day. Thank you for coming out with me. Jordan replied. Thanks for bringing us. Still not going to tell me where we're going? Nope. Hmm. As we sped through the salty spray, I told stories of islands full of lost pirate treasures while Jordan listened in awe, and Lindsay kept watch for the occasional acrobatic dolphin or sailfish. We laughed and played as the morning wore on. I even let Jordan man the helm for a while. We were enjoying the trip, though after a few hours, the first signs of impatience began to spoil my peaceful, happy mood. We should have been getting close, and I had expected to see a few seagulls circling in the sky. Without a hint of land anywhere nearby, I began to worry. Lindsay joined me at the helm and kissed my cheek. Mark? Yeah? How much longer? I checked the map again. Are we on the wrong heading? I wondered. Jordan, standing at the bow, began jumping and waving his finger at the horizon. Look! An island! I let out a relieved sigh. <sighs> That's it! We're here! I squinted. But I think that's a key. Bit strange this far out. What's a key? I got this. <clears throat> Jordan, keys are formed on top of coral instead of from volcanic eruptions. So in other words, most of the sand you see isn't really sand. It's the bones of millions and millions of tiny dead sea creatures. Rah! She turned toward me. <laughs> right? Um, close enough. How did you know that? Two semesters of oceanography. She winked and then went back to her hammock. I navigated the boat over a reef toward a small lagoon. Black coral reached from the ocean floor, harmlessly scratching at the bottom of the hull. Jordan dropped anchor where the water was shallow enough for us to swim to shore. Oh, wow. Lindsay murmured, staring at the huge square structure at the edge of the cove. It looks like the ruins of some sort of ancient lighthouse. Yeah, but I saw six of them on the map. Even if this used to be a shipping lane, no one would need that many lighthouses around a small key. I think they were watchtowers. Six? She scanned the beach and then nodded at several piles of boulders scattered along the bank. Six left standing, maybe. I bet there used to be even more. The rocks were the remnants of another watchtower, a fallen sentry sinking below the shifting sands. I think you're right. Lindsay gave the monolith a nervous glance. This isn't a good idea, Mark. We should head back. 
Jordan whispered. Do you think people still live here? No, I said. Listen, just stay near the boat. I want to have a quick look around, and then we can go. Fair enough? Okay, but please hurry. This place is creeping me out. Lindsay stayed on the boat while Jordan and I swam to shore. Halfway there, I began to sense something wasn't quite right with the water. I don't see any fish, Jordan said. That's it, I thought. Something must have scared them away. Swim faster, Jordan. Why? Is there a shark? He laughed. Just swim faster. We paddled hard until we reached the beach, both of us out of breath. Lindsay yelled. You okay? We're fine. I'll be back in ten. I want to go inside with you, Jordan said. No way, I replied, looking up at the watchtower. The top was like an open gazebo with a moss-covered, crumbling battlement held up by eight stone pillars. Stay on the beach. I don't want you out of your mother's sight. Hmm. With a sigh of resignation, Jordan picked up a flat rock and skipped it across the lagoon's calm water. I patted his head and then climbed up the bank to the base of the watchtower. The design was militaristic in nature, perhaps a civil war outpost, or maybe a relic from the conquistadors of the 16th century. Either way, I was sure the island had once been a fort. How old are you? I wondered. I ran my hands over the smooth rock wall. A studded iron band wrapped around the foundation, thick as a bank vault door. On the ocean side of the watchtower, links of heavy chain, like those found on an ocean liner, stretched from the metal band out into the surf. The anchor point was a notch and lever system, though the turning wheel was missing. I imagine it had been used to pull a ship closer to the beach, or to keep it stabilized during a strong storm. After admiring the ancient ingenuity, I walked to the top of the dune next to the watchtower and examined the key as a whole. Other than the towers, the key appeared no different from any of the other uninhabited land masses in the general area. Then, once again, I felt as though something was wrong with the place. Like the island was somehow angered by our trespassing. I pushed the silly thought to the back of my mind and hiked down the other side of the dune through knee-high brush, most of it dead shades of yellow and brown. A sudden scream prickled the hair on the nape of my neck. I whirled and charged back toward the inlet. Jordan! Lindsay called. I reached the peak of the dune in time to see her dive into the water. I slid down the slope as she swam fast to shore. Jordan backed away from something on the beach, still screaming. When I reached him, he hugged me tight. I quickly looked him over. He wasn't injured, just frightened. What is it, buddy? You're okay? Lindsay hurled herself up the bank, kicking up sand as she ran. Is he hurt? I patted his curly black hair. No, I don't think so. The shoe! Jordan said, pointing behind Lindsay. She tilted her head to the side. What? What are you talking about? Looking over her shoulder, I caught sight of a dirty old sneaker lying in the weeds, far above the high tide line. Snakes? I wondered. Lindsay, take him, I said, prying his arms from my waist. I retrieved the sneaker and nearly jumped out of my skin when I saw the severed foot inside, bones dry and skin like leather. I dropped the shoe and looked from Jordan to Lindsay, holding each other in the large shadow of the watchtower. A ringing echoed in my ears, so loud that it would have drowned out the sound of birds, except that I suddenly realized there were no birds. 
nor from what I observed any other type of wildlife. What is it, Mark? We need to go now. The key was a dead zone. My gut instinct at that moment told me a predator had marked the territory and chased away anything it hadn't killed. I ran into the water, treading and swimming. Lindsay and Jordan were right behind me. I dove and swam faster underwater, wanting to radio the Coast Guard as quickly as possible. That's when I first saw it. A massive black shadow coming in from the deeper sea. Get back! Get back! I yelled the second I surfaced, and I gestured wildly in an effort to wave them to shore. Seized by fear as I was, though, my arms refused to paddle. Swim! My mind screamed. But which way? I was closer to the shore, but I had to reach the boat. Shark! Jordan's call broke the mental block. I dove again and pressed on as quickly as possible. The thing was so massive and fast, growing larger with each heartbeat, but it didn't move like any shark I'd ever seen. Instead of darting straight toward me, the shadow slashed left and right, quick as a stinging bee. Suddenly, a second one jetted across my field of view. Then there was a third, and a fourth, and then too many to count. Underwater, my scream oscillated my eardrums as I spun, searching for the direction of the next encounter. The things were swirling around me like a vortex, lashing like soundless whips. I swam like a madman, and somehow I made it. Just as I gripped the first rung of the ladder, the boat vanished. It was taken so fast, somehow ripped down under the waves, that the force twisted my shoulder out of its socket. Then the suction pulled me under before my mind could comprehend what had just happened. I caught a better glimpse of what had taken the boat and then fought my way back to the surface. Lindsay and Jordan were on the sand, screaming incoherently, but I was petrified. All I could do was gasp for air and wait for death to take me. The shadows in the water weren't separate creatures. No. They were all smaller pieces of a beast prehistoric in size. Violently, I was pulled beneath the surface again and couldn't tell up from down. Head over feet, I tumbled through the thrashing whitewash, lungs burning for air. Then my head cracked against the hull of my boat and everything went black. As the sun touched the horizon, Jordan found me half buried in sand near the center of the key, bleeding from a gash above my eye. The thick, bitter taste of salt was the first thing I recalled, followed by the searing pain in my shoulder. Though I don't remember what had happened after the thing pulled me to the ocean floor, I know neither of them had seen it. If they had... A glimmer of insanity would have surely been present in their eyes. As I lay on the dune, assessing my wounds, Lindsay paced back and forth. The lagoon receded so fast. What? The riptide pulled you down. I was sure you were dead. It wasn't a rip. We ran into the tower before the tsunami came crashing in. The water chased us up the steps. Mark, we almost didn't make it. You did the right thing. I'm glad you're okay. And you're lucky to be alive. Depending on your definition of luck, I thought. Though she wasn't ready to face the truth, she was right. Somehow, I had survived with only a dislocated shoulder, a nasty bump, and maybe a few cracked ribs to accompany my lacerated back. I stood, 
testing my weight. It would hurt to walk, but I could manage. The injuries were nothing compared to the bigger problem. Jordan cried. What are we going to do? You told someone where we were going today, right? Of course. I lied. Leaning on Lindsay's shoulder, I looked at each of the crumbling watchtowers in turn, then at the grim landscape. Scattered across the sands were pieces of wreckage from my boat, broken links of the thick shipping chain and other useless debris. Total destruction. The way everything was soaked in salt oddly reminded me of the destroyed city of Carthage. You look like you might have a plan, Lindsay said. I nodded. I think others have been stranded here. Many, many others trapped exactly like us. Maybe even the people who built this place up. We need to use a watchtower to signal help. But the sharks sank our boat. We'll do the same to anyone else. Not sharks. Lindsay furrowed her brow. What? Nothing. It isn't important. Right now, we need to find supplies. Just don't go near the water. We all went separate ways, planning to check around the island for anything of use. I found a few bone fragments of a long dead castaway in one standing tower, and an old rusted sword in another, but little else. Along the way, I passed several fallen towers, nothing left of them but broken stone and iron links. The sky was crimson by the time we met back at the watchtower overlooking the cove. Lindsay hadn't found anything helpful, only some tattered clothing and an empty soup can. Jordan had discovered a few glass bottles and suggested we craft a message to launch into the Atlantic. A swell idea, probably the best that any of us had to offer. If only we had found a pencil. A large brass basin stood in the center of the gazebo level of the watchtower. I brought up a bundle of devil grass and driftwood. Though it took a while, I was able to build a decent fire using some long dormant camping skills. We sat near one of the stone pillars and looked out over the darkening sea. At least it's warm, I said. Jordan traced one of the markings etched into the pillars. What do you think these mean? I don't know. They look like crude hieroglyphics. Lindsay stood and raised her voice. I want to make a fire in each tower. The rescue party will have a better chance at finding us. I'll go. Your arm. She sighed and then whispered low enough so that Jordan couldn't hear. <sighs> no one knows we're out here, do they? No. And it wasn't sharks? No. Lindsay walked away, then paused at the edge of the stairs, as if waiting for me to say something that would make the situation better. Mom, I'm hungry. Jordan said, breaking the uncomfortable silence. I know. So am I. I kept quiet, aside from the fact that I didn't have any answers. I had read stories of stranded families in hostile environments. Sometimes people turn to cannibalism when the hunger grows sharp enough, first eating those already dead before turning on each other. Maybe that's what happened to the owner of the shoe, or maybe his foot was left over from the creature's last snack. I wondered how long Lindsay's body would sustain Jordan and me. And when our eyes met, I swear she was thinking the exact same thing about my body. In either case, Jordan would be next, no doubt. It shouldn't have to come to that, I said, shaking my head. I took in a deep breath, tasting the salt once more. There's something else about keys that differ from islands. They don't have any natural sources of fresh water. 
We'll die of thirst first. Lindsay stormed away, carrying a flaming branch to light other signal fires. Jordan and I sat in silence, waiting for her to return. It wasn't the quality time I had hoped to spend with the boy. The sky darkened, and one by one, bright yellow lights sparked to life in each of the watchtowers. When the last was lit, the crash of a massive wave jarred me to my feet. Water spread across the quay, sweeping away what had remained of my boat. Then something roared louder than a howling tornado. My face went numb as my heart clenched. It was back. We gotta go get Mom! I grabbed Jordan by the shirt and white hot pain shot up my arm. Lindsay called from the top of the closest watchtower and then screamed. The scream was cut short as her body ripped in two. And the halves fell to the sand below. A split second later, the fire in that tower suddenly blinked out. Jordan tried to yell for her. I held my hand over his mouth, muffling his cries. It's too late. She's gone, I said, and released my grip, allowing him to run off to be gutted, too, if that's what he wanted. Instead, he just stood there shaking like a leaf in his red swimming trunks. Our watchtower began to tremble. I rushed to the edge and looked down. Though dark, the chain appeared taut in the moonlight, and the whole tower vibrated from the tension. Then my eyes were drawn to the other towers. Each light vanished as a long, spiky tentacle reached in below the battlement. The fires! Jordan, quick, put it out! A tentacle shot by my neck. Nearly decapitating me. Deadly black barbs protruding from the slime-covered arm dripped black liquid. It lashed again, and I jumped back, almost falling from the edge. Jordan stomped at the flames, ducking as the trunk blindly twisted around the room. He smothered the fire while avoiding the barbs as they stabbed at the air. When glowing embers were all that remained in the basin, the tentacle slowly retreated. Panting, I looked out across the sea, following the mass of flesh as it gyrated away. Are you alright? Jordan gripped my hand and let out a hopeless whimper. Then he ran from the watchtower howling in unearthly sound reserved for those who have had their sanity ripped to shreds. My heart broke for the poor boy as he crawled across the sand drift over to the top half of his dead mother. It was my fault. I had killed her by bringing them to the key. But my mind was too far gone to feel the pain. Behind the dunes, against the backdrop of an ocean of stars, the colossal creature stood in the open sea. It roared again. And I understood, as never before, how meager we humans truly are. Dozens of chains hung from its neck and tentacles. Most of the bindings were broken, and the few remaining were pulled tight against the watchtowers that still stood. It had been captured 
long, long ago, and the passage of time had not calmed the hatred for the jailers and their fire. Slowly, the massive black frame lowered into the water, disappearing under the waves. I continued to stare out at the serene night, certain no one had ever survived the key. Like those thousand fierce tentacles hiding just below the surface, I quivered and patiently waited to be free. Ladder to Oblivion by Max Shepard Performed by Kristen Holland A cursory internet search will reveal that there were 91 unlicensed NES games. But I know that's not true. There's one more, and I've seen it. It's real, and its name is Ladder to Oblivion. I'll tell you as much as I can, and I hope that by the end you'll understand why... I will never play it. As you probably know, Nintendo created a worldwide phenomenon in North America in 1986 when it released its Nintendo Entertainment System, the NES. By that time, more than 2.5 million units of the console had already been sold in Japan. The success of the system in America single-handedly revitalized the struggling video game industry. By 1990, 30% of American households owned the NES, beating the percentage that owned personal computers by 7%. I grew up in one of those households. I remember my dad bringing the NES home for the first time, beaming with pride. I was in complete awe. I remember sitting in our sunken living room and playing Super Mario Brothers for hours upon hours. What I didn't know back then was that making games for the NES was big business. Part of the reason the system was so successful was because Nintendo actively courted third-party developers for its fledgling system. Because Nintendo possessed a near monopoly on the video game market, they were able to enforce their standards and policies with an iron fist. Eventually, this got the attention of the United States Department of Justice, which started looking into the company's business practices. Once the Federal Trade Commission got involved, Nintendo changed some of the strict terms of its agreements. By Nintendo's count, there were 671 licensed games for the NES. That list grows to 677 if you include the three 10-gen games that were only temporarily licensed, and several others, such as Miracle Piano, which were left off Nintendo's list for unknown reasons. To enforce its licensing standards, Nintendo created the 10NES authentication chip. When the system detected the chip in the cartridge, the game would be playable. Otherwise, no dice. As you can imagine, many companies either didn't want to pay the licensing fee, or were rejected as officially licensed partners by Nintendo based on the quality of their games. Hence the 91 unlicensed games. To skirt the protection of the 10 NES chips, some companies configured their hardware to create a several millisecond voltage spike that short-circuited the authentication chip for just a moment thus allowing their game to be played. Interesting stuff, right? Well, I thought so, and so did my father. He worked for Nintendo in the development and licensing department during the late 80s and early 90s, and got to experience all of the drama as it happened. However, the story of Ladder to Oblivion, the game that never was, does not begin with my dad. It begins with Rob, the founder of a game development company, and his idea for a new kind of video game. Rob was in his senior year at West Lafayette High School in Indiana when Super Mario Brothers was released for the NES. Like thousands of other kids around the country, he quickly became obsessed. After graduation, Rob decided to attend Purdue University to study computer science. He wanted to make video games. Purdue's computer sciences department moved into a newly renovated building in the fall of 1985, and Rob took full advantage of it when he started college the next year. Four years later, he graduated with honors at the top of his class. My dad always said Rob was one of the smartest people he'd ever met. Regrettably, he said, Rob also had some serious personal demons. 
Rob's father was murdered during a home invasion when he was young. His mother was spared and raised him on her own. Unfortunately, the trauma she had experienced sent her careening through years of alcoholism and depression. Unsurprisingly, Rob was neglected, and it was only a matter of time before Child Protective Services stepped in and took custody of him. At first, he acted out, but eventually Rob rose above the unfortunate hand he'd been dealt. When Super Mario Brothers came out in his senior year, it seemed as if he'd found the escape he'd been seeking. My father told me the story about the day he first spoke to Rob a dozen times. It was May 25th, 1992, and he was sitting at his desk when the phone rang. The voice on the other side hesitated for a moment, and then said in a rush, How'd you like to be rich? My dad had heard a version of that question a hundred times, and typically hung up immediately upon hearing it. But that time was different. Something in the man's voice intrigued him. I'd love to, he joked. Do you have a secret to winning the lottery? The voice on the other end of the line was humorless. I've got something much better. And what's that? My dad shot back. A new type of game, one the world has never seen before. I'm listening, my dad replied. Rob introduced himself as the president of a fledgling game company called LTO. At the time, my father had no idea Rob was the company's sole proprietor. The young man went on to describe the game he was working on as a platformer, where the player moved across the screen from left to right, collecting items and power-ups and fighting enemies along the way. At the end of each level, there would be a boss, with an ultimate boss at the end of the game. My dad informed Rob that Nintendo had already produced a game like that, to which Rob confidently replied, the differences are in the details. According to Rob, his game would begin with a young man who finds a strange wooden ladder protruding out of the ground. Upon climbing down the ladder, the character would discover that he couldn't go back up again. The only way would be forward. Just like real life, Rob remarked. At the end of each level, the player would battle a demon that appeared in the form of someone from their past. In every case, the enemy took the form of someone, perhaps a teacher, a parent, or a friend, who had harmed the main character in the past. After defeating the demon, the player climbed down to the next level. Nine levels had been planned. In each subsequent stage, the screen would become darker and the enemies more powerful. By the ninth and final level, the player would barely be able to see their way through the darkness. At the very end, the ultimate boss appeared, and the player would discover the truth, that the entity they'd been after the entire time was none other than a mirror image of themselves. Defeating the final boss would reveal a new ladder that led back up to the surface. What happens when the player fails? My dad asked. You don't want to know, Rob cryptically responded. Okay, so what's this game called? Dad asked. Ladder to Oblivion. Rob replied, nearly whispering. Eventually, Rob convinced Dad to meet with him in order to show him the game. It wasn't quite finished, but the young developer promised that the first seven levels were playable. My father was mesmerized. He told me it made him feel like no game ever had before. He began to see the bosses at the end of each level as the people who had wronged him. A fourth grade teacher who once humiliated him in front of his class. An old high school friend that he claimed had stolen his girlfriend. It was as if the game changed depending on who was playing it. When my dad brought the game to Nintendo, they refused to approve Rob's company as an officially licensed developer. Nintendo had very strict rules about the type of content that their partners could include in their games. Among other things, nudity, gore, cursing, and religious symbols were prohibited. Ladder to Oblivion's theme and content violated none of these restrictions, but it was rejected all the same. It was simply too dark, the higher-ups argued. Rob was crushed. Dad said, understandably so. He'd worked on Ladder to Oblivion for the better part of three years, my dad told me the day of the final rejection was the last time he'd ever spoken to Rob. I begged my father many times to try and get in touch with Rob. Maybe he still had a copy of the game and we could play it together, 
for old time's sake. Maybe, he said to me once, averting his gaze. I'll see if I can dig up his number. At some point, I forgot all about Ladder to Oblivion and figured the story ended just the way my father said all those years ago. But I was wrong. This past week, my father committed suicide. My mother found him in the woods behind our house, the shotgun he'd used lying several inches from his outstretched hand. The news was totally unexpected and was a shock to my entire family. My dad was a happy man. As far as I knew, he'd never suffered from depression. I was devastated. Seeking closure, I visited my dad's study. He and I had spent hours in there together, playing old NES games and reliving his days at Nintendo. On a whim, I grabbed Super Mario Brothers out of its case, intending to play a final round in his honor. When I went to put it in, I found another game inside. That was odd, I thought. Dad never left games inside the console. He used to tell me it made them wear out quicker. The art was just how I'd pictured it all those years. An 8-bit image of a ladder descending into a raging fire. It was Ladder to Oblivion. That's when I noticed the note taped to the back of the console. I pulled it free and saw the first line said simply, To my son. I considered reciting the letter in its entirety, but decided against it. The words don't reflect my dad's personality in the slightest. They're too... dark. So I'll paraphrase instead. The day Ladder to Oblivion was rejected, Rob and my father discussed things at length, and my father was invited to become a partner at LTO. Together, he and Rob would complete Ladder to Oblivion and release it as an unlicensed game. My dad knew all about Nintendo's authentication chip and how to work around it. He and Rob both understood that many companies had already produced successful unlicensed games. However, they knew there were risks. There was a distinct possibility that Nintendo could, at any time, devise new methods to prevent the playing of unauthorized games. In spite of their concerns, Rob and my father decided to take their chances. Dad accepted Rob's offer, on the condition that his involvement remain private. His day job was what paid the bills, after all. Seven months later, Ladder to Oblivion was completed. Rob called my dad and told him the news. Dad was excited beyond measure. The next day, he had the game loaded onto two pre-production cartridges. He even had a trusted friend in the art department whip up a label complete with Nintendo's seal of quality. That way, Dad reasoned, they'd think he was working on something for the company. Rob insisted on doing a complete playthrough on his own in order to catch any remaining bugs and promised to call my father once he'd finished. They agreed they would meet afterwards, at which point my dad would test the game as well and discuss the next steps. When five days passed with no word from Rob, dad set out for his partner's house and showed up unannounced. They hadn't spoken since the phone call and dad had begun to worry that Rob had released the game on his own and cut him out of the profits. What he discovered was much worse. Rob was dead. At that point in the letter, my father began ranting about God and the devil, and his writing became borderline illegible. Sentences were scribbled over so heavily that they became virtually indecipherable. I was able to make out that Rob had left a note, which consisted of only four words. Never climb the ladder. At the end of the page, my dad hastily scrawled what he suspected had led to Rob's fate. He finally faced himself. While Dad was terribly upset at Rob's death, he was undeterred. Ladder to Oblivion had taken control of his life. Ever since he'd played it that first time, he'd been battling a secret depression, something that I don't think anyone knew. The only thing he believed would make him happy again would be to release the game to the public. The following day, my dad partnered with an entrepreneurial-minded friend from his college days by the name of Eddie. That night, 
they got together to play the game. Dad started, but ended up leaving after the seventh level to grab some pizza. When he returned, he found Eddie dead, with Game Over flashing on the screen. Both of his partner's wrists had been slashed, with strange symbols carved into the flesh. My father's note gets harder and harder to read from that point, but it seems as if he was trying to describe the symbols he'd seen. Either way, I couldn't make heads or tails of it. At that point, he says he was convinced the game was responsible for both Rob and Eddie's deaths, as well as his worsening depression. He tucked the game away, vowing to never play it again. But he couldn't quite bear to get rid of it. For 24 years, my dad kept his promise. He never played the game all the way through. Until recently, that is. What I'm about to recite next to my father's last words. Verbatim, you can draw your own conclusions. 24 years of guilt finally caught up with me today. I climbed the ladder. Something I said I'd never do. I faced myself. And I was judged unworthy. Just like Rob. Just like Eddie. There's something wrong with the letter. Almost like consciousness. It's more than just the sum of its parts. It looks deep inside you. Too deep for light. To the places you didn't know existed. Son, I don't want to die. I want to live. But my shotgun is sitting on the floor beside me and I can hear it speaking to me. It sounds so sweet. Its voice is a siren's song. If I can ignore it, I'll tear up this letter and you'll never know the difference. I'm sorry I lied to you. I'm sorry for a lot of things. Please know that I love you. Please move on. I'm going outside. I can't take it. Please. Never climb the ladder. It knows. I, for one, believe my dad. No matter what you all might say. He never told me what happened to Rob's copy of the game. For all I know, it's still out there. No one comes up here. Written by Sumaya Tasneem. Narrated by James Cleveland. Featuring Eric Seismeyer, Alicia Pavlis, David Alnwick, and Jesse Cornett. I looked up from where I stood. Just a couple of steps and I would reach my destination. My heart hammered like a million pounding drums. My head was dizzy with excitement. Behind me, I heard my friends grunt and pant as they struggled, clambering over the jagged and broken rocks. I stood straight and proud as I took the final step, summiting the cliff. I gazed over my shoulder to check on my friends. They weren't far behind. Come on, hurry up. We're almost there, I called. Jackson, how far is it from here? 
Alice asked as she managed to wrench herself forward. It's right there, over that cliff. She continued walking, and some other people followed. In all honesty, I didn't know most of them. I had only brought them along because I needed a good support team. There were seven, including me. Adam, Alice and Brad were the only ones with whom I was well acquainted. They were fit for the job and very obedient, exactly what I needed. I wasn't thrilled about the fact that I would have to share my money with them after we achieved our goal and handed our pictures over to the mayor, but I had made peace with it. My only goal right now was to climb up Channel Mountain, get some pictures and climb back down. Channel Mountain, as the articles say, is this mountain with a flat top. The place has massive number of trees all over it, except for this clean path running north to south. A clear, channel-like road, hence the name, Channel Mountain. There is a way up from one side and a safer way down from the other. No one before us has had the guts to come up here, so of course I decided to do it build my own team and use my own technology to show everyone what this place actually looked like. Naturally, the money we'd receive was a strong incentive. Finally, I reached the very edge. I held my breath and took the final step up, too excited to wait for the rest of them. That was when I first saw Channel Mountain. It had more of an impact in person than anything the articles had conveyed. The air was thick and misty, like a cold cloud of shriveling fog. My breath froze within me at the very sight of it. The sky suddenly looked pale. There was a clear road at the centre, and the corners stood lush, oddly shaped lines of trees. Their branches stretched long and far from the trunks. The trees looked quite healthy and well tended. Strange, I thought, as there was no one else up here to look after them. At least, that's what the article said. The path reached into the distance, as far as my eyes could see. It looked almost endless. The area ahead of me was blurred and obscured by the thick fog hanging in the air like stone-cold smoke. I admired what lay in front of me. That's when a strange feeling ignited and stirred inside my gut. A burning sensation, somewhere between foreboding and guilt. A feeling that warned me of danger, demanding that I turn away. I wanted to turn around and maybe forget about the whole thing, but my team finally caught up with me, and I heard most of them gasp when they saw what I saw. them said. There was a pause as my friends absorbed the atmosphere of the roadway. Oh wow, oh. Seen like this? <sighs> Is this the place? Brad asked, his voice raspy. Why does it feel so... creepy? No, it wasn't creepy. Creepy wasn't the word to describe it. It was more... unsettling. There was a visceral feeling of dangerous uncertainty flowing through the air of the place. No word I could think of was powerful or accurate enough to describe what we felt. I was just a tiny inch away from the mist of the forest. Just one more step and I would physically feel the fog. It took every ounce of willpower in me to convince myself to move on. But I reminded myself of the money and what I had put myself and my team through to get up here in the first place. We had already climbed for God knows how long to get to the top. After that much effort, I was quite sure no one would want to turn back. After all, the end of the mountain was a long way back down. Besides, the walk along the road wasn't that long either. It shouldn't take us more than 30 minutes to get to the other side. Well, I guess we should get moving, I said, trying to sound enthusiastic. My voice came out cracked and unconvincing. I took a step forward, 
then slowly and steadily stepped into the mist. The white fog gently stroked my skin, leaving light goosebumps all over me. I trembled a bit, then, without warning, a feeling of dread poured over me, making me regret my decision almost immediately. Nothing about the place felt right. Darkness swept through my mind. I felt it, an extra presence. Someone or something apart from the other members of my team. Although no one was seen, there was a presence. I could feel it. An evil, deceptive danger watching us as we took every breath. My friends were utterly silent. Looking at them, I could see their fear. It was written all over their faces. They all wanted to turn back, but no one wanted to admit it. No one wanted to be the first one to snap under the pressure. After another pause, I continued to walk. Our footsteps echoed through the empty space. It was like walking through an empty, hollow shell. Our breathing had become unsettled and sharp as we kept alert, our eyes wide open and our ears sharper than ever. Adam, our camera boy, was immersed in his work. He snapped his flashlight to everything he saw. Everything of recording he documented to be taken back as the evidence needed to collect our prize money. Glancing down, I noticed that even the grass around the bases of the trees looked odd, like thin green needles found inside vaccination syringes. We walked around for three minutes, and some people began to complain. Why are we even here? Is this even worth it? Brad was starting his usual annoying behavior. At the moment, I had no interest in dealing with it. For all the money we'd get, yes, it is, I said firmly. I was clearly lying to myself, but I couldn't let anyone see my weakness or question me at this point. How do you know if there's even a way down? No one comes up here, said Brad. The articles predicted there would be. They predicted. How would you know for sure we can get out of here? Brad questioned. Well, he, he's got a point. Alice cut in hesitantly, trying to make it look like she wasn't taking anyone's side. Everyone thought for a while, then their half-expectant and half-angry eyes gazed at me, demanding an explanation. Of course, it was my plan. And by extension, problems that arose were my fault. But really, who wouldn't want a lifetime supply of money? Guys, I began, this is not the time to blame each other. Their faces looked more disapproving. Look, we'll get out of here, I promise. And what if we don't? It'll be your fault. Brad was clearly not about to let this go. I sighed. Why did I bring him along? <sighs> Guys, look, for now, just trust me. Right at the end of this path, there is a way down. We'll just have to keep walking. Everyone else seemed more relaxed as a result of my front of certainty, but Brad refused to budge. So you got us up here without even knowing the goddamned way out? I just told you how to get down. I shot back. You said the article... Predicted. How does predicted suggest anything close to certainty? He was like an annoying ten-year-old. That's when I lost it. Brad, if you don't shut up, I'll throw you down the cliff. If you stop being such a jerk, we can all leave this place with our sanity. See? It's absolutely clear you don't know what you're doing. My blood began to boil. He was right. All that he said was right, and that's what pissed me off. Just shut up! I screamed at him at the top of my lungs, almost tearing my vocal cords with the ferocity. Brad fell silent. Everyone fell silent. At first, I thought it was because of my outburst. 
But then I realized he wasn't looking at me. None of them were. They stared way past me, their eyes reflecting pure underlying horror. I followed their gazes. It led into the dense line of trees. For a minute, I couldn't comprehend what had scared them so. Then I saw it. At first, relief washed through me. It looked like a figure of a lady, faded and unclear through the mist. She walked closer. I noticed her features grow more and more defined with every step. I noticed that she was tall, really tall. I noticed that her skin was covered in scars. No, not scars. It looked more like the skin on her body was actually tattered or frayed, like some sort of fabric. I noticed that her limbs were really long. I noticed she only had a few grass-like hairs on her head. I noticed how awkwardly she walked in stiff, jerky movements. When she finally came into clear view, I understood why my friends looked so terrified. Just a few meters away stood the ugliest, weirdest creature I had ever seen. A sight which would haunt our memories for the rest of our living minutes. She breathed like a tire deflating. Her head was covered by a few patches of grass. Her torso stretched to seven feet high and her arms were like long, lanky pieces of wood. Her skin resembled the flaked fiber of wooden trunks. She had only one eye on the left, which was a pure silver color. It had no iris, but I could tell it was looking straight at us. For a few seconds, none of us moved. Her eyeball rolled from me to Alice then to Brad, then to Adam, then to the rest of us. From the corner of my eye, I saw Adam step forward and place his eye at the lens of the camera, crouching slightly to get a good shot of it. Adam, no! I tried to warn him, but it was too late. Adam pressed the trigger. The light flared from his camera and right into the thing's beady little eyeball. The creature flinched in shock letting out the most haunting and blood-curdling scream. Her scream echoed in her ears, ringing like a million sirens. She crouched down on all fours and in the blink of an eye charged straight at us. Alice screamed as she sprinted in the opposite direction. Without thinking, we ran after her. We were running the wrong way, I knew, but it was too late. We had to escape from that... thing. Adrenaline shot through my body as I felt my heart pound loudly in my ears. We ran blindly along that path of fog which became thicker and thicker as we ran. I think we lost her! Brad screamed, his voice hoarse. We slowed our pace, but remained on high alert. The fog was thicker now, like a solid cloud. All the members in our party were close by, but they looked like faded shadows, like thin fragments. What the hell was that? Adam yelled, gasping for breath. Why don't you ask the guy who got us into this? I could feel Brad's gaze on me. Do you even know that creature lives up here? How would I? So you didn't know anything about this? I knew it. I, I just knew it. You just got us here for that stupid money, didn't you? Brad yelled, his voice echoing through the forest. As he ranted, my mind could only think that, God forbid, he might attract that creature again. Brad, just shut up. She might hear us. I'm not shutting up until you admit that I'm right! I didn't know we'd get a visit from Mrs. Horrifying Plant Lady, alright? 
The article said nothing about any of that. Why the hell would anyone rely on some stupid random article at the back of a paper no one reads? Is that the sort of thing you use to make important life decisions? That's enough, Brad. Stay quiet or you'll come back. Adam cut in, coming to my defense. We should probably go to the other side of this place. That's the way down. I could tell he was speaking to me. All right, is everyone here? I asked. Everyone answered like a disjointed roll call, but I could feel someone's absence. Wait, where's Alice? Everyone gazed at each other, scanning to find the brunette in the mist. She was right here in front of me. Adam said, unable to disguise the panic in his voice. Everyone was growing frantic with fear. Our breathing was getting faster, irregular, and we shuffled nervously on the dry, sandy path as we continued searching for our friend. The trees! Adam finally said. Maybe she went into the forest. His voice was trying to reassure himself as much as come for others. Yeah, maybe she did. My throat was like sandpaper. But what about that monster? Someone yelled. She must be quite far behind us by now. We ran for quite a long time, I said, and stepped forward, ignoring any further protest. Everyone headed to the dense canopy of trees. I felt my shoe dig into the surprisingly wet mud. My feet sank in, and I had to struggle to take one step at a time. No one complained. They all just wanted to find Alice and get out of this weird place. Just a few steps in, someone nearly lost their mind. Guys, it feels like the mud's sucking me in, Adam said in a voice of alarm. It's just mud, Adam. Grow up, Brad scolded. But I, too, could feel something going on in the mud. I did feel suction, a pull from below. I feel it, someone said. I feel it, too. Another admitted. Well, I don't. Brad rolled his eyes. Grow up, all of you. We need to... His sentence was interrupted. Without any warning, Brad went down. He didn't lose his balance and stumble. He didn't trip over anything. To all our horror, we watched as Brad was sucked into the muddy, wet ground like it was a giant vacuum cleaner. It happened so fast it was over almost before I could process what I was seeing. And the last thing we saw of him was his hand, with his Rolex watch reaching out of the mud, desperately trying to claw his way to the surface. Adam lunged to his rescue. But within a second, he fell in too, and was quickly submerged in the muck. I heard someone scream, then everyone burst into panic. We tried to run, but the mud was growing thicker and heavier, and worst of all, harder. Hard enough to slow us down. In matters of seconds, everyone around me was sucked in, one by one. I watched helplessly as my friends disappeared. And then, suddenly I was alone. For a second, nothing happened. I was left with white, thick, suffocating fog, and with a curtain of dead silence falling all around me. I knew I was about to be the final victim. I knew I was being watched. I knew I was being saved for the last. And I felt it. The iron grip of a giant, ragged hand wrap around my ankle. I was next. The hand pulled me down with unimaginable strength and force. At first, I felt my body move down wet mud. And then I simply felt like I was falling. It was just a couple of seconds until a long, rough, coil-like structure wrapped around me, holding me firmly in place. I coughed as my throat burned from the mud inside. I gasped for breath and opened my eyes. A jaw hung open at what I saw. On top of me was a large dome of soil with roots hanging down, looking thick and healthy. From the dome protruded an endless number of giant roots, each of which held something at its end in tight, round coils. I wanted to scream when I realized what were in the coils. They were bony remains. Human remains. 
and now I was coiled in just like them. Around me, all my friends were also held tightly in their own coils, all screaming in despair. It took me a moment to realize precisely at what they were screaming. Then I saw them. At the tops of the roots were tiny little creatures, miniature versions of the plant lady we saw earlier. Millions of them crouched on all fours, their silver eyes glaring down at us in a combination of surprise, amusement, and awe. They made the same horrible sound their mother did, and began to crawl down the roots, coming straight for us. I heard Alice scream, and realized that she was on the coil right next to me. The grubby little creatures climbed on her body. I saw one of them sink its teeth into her arm. She screamed in pain and I felt paralyzed with fear. The same happened to everyone. One by one I saw their blood, I saw their bones and I heard their cries grow muffled and then cease entirely as the creatures devoured them alive. When finally the creatures cleared away from the coils, I saw the remains of all my friends. These people, alive just minutes ago, now lay broken and twisted in the grips of the coil-like rag dolls. Their flesh and muscles pulled away from their bones. Those creatures must have enjoyed my expression of pure horror. Then they began to crawl toward me. I was their main course. I could barely whimper as I struggled on the root coils, trying to pry them off me trying to cut them with my teeth, trying to do anything to break their fierce grip on me. The coils had the sturdiness of hard cement. There was no escape. The creatures climbed onto my body, and still I fought the inevitable, trying everything to push them away. But just as they descended on me, a loud, ragged voice spoke. Now, now, children, leave the next one for mommy. Those words froze every muscle in my body. I saw her appear as her children scurried away. Her tree bark like mouth parted into a gruesome grin. Mm, you're a good one. She said as her enormous hand squeezed my leg. You've got some nice freshness and some glory, muscle. Her hands released me from the coils as she clasped me in her palm. I'm glad you're here. She said happily, sitting down cross-legged on the ground like she was getting ready to have a picnic. I haven't had such a good meal in ages. After all, no one comes up here. I screamed as loud as I could. But ignoring my cries, she closed her mouth around my head. I shut my eyes, awaiting the end. A moist, warm gush of wind rushed around my head. Her twig-like teeth pierced the flesh of my neck and I felt a forceful pull on my head. The excruciating pain overwhelmed me. Every second brought new depths of agony and terror. Finally, just when I could take no more, my vision went black. After that, I felt nothing. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.